Hi, uh, thank you everybody for coming. It's, um, it's a real treat to be here. Uh, I talk, I give presentations all over the country and uh, uh, I rarely give a talk uh, here in Bozeman. I gave a uh, Pachachka about a year ago, but that's um, 20 slides in six minutes. Uh, <laughs> so this is a little different from that. Um, and uh, I, I hope we have some time left over for discussion because what, this is something I've never done before. This particular presentation, I just put these thoughts together. It's a theory that I have and I want to test it on you and tell me whether it makes any sense. Um, so I'd love to hear some of your, uh, some of your background. So, um, or at least, um, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Um, I'd like to hear some of your opinions. Um, so first of all, um, let me just introduce you to the West. It's 11 Western states, the way we define it. As you can see here, um, about half of the land is public lands, federal public lands managed by the BLM and the Forest Service, Park Service. Uh, so that's what you see in yellow and in green. So it's, it's an area of vast distances. And it's an area that for most of us as we drive around looks very rural. Um, as um, Dr. Ray said, uh, we, uh, we have an organization called Headwaters Economics. We're in Bozeman. We do work um, all over the West. We do some work in other parts of the uh, country as well, including um, some recent work in, in the state of Maine. Um, and we're an independent nonprofit, um, uh, nonpartisan research group. And we tend to take on issues that are really tough ones. Like, how do you solve the issue of home building in the wildland urban interface? How do you protect homes? How do you make homes safe from wildfire? That's a tremendously difficult problem. And we said, oh, that's great. Let's uh, launch into it and see what we come up with. Um, we, um, we, we have a staff of about uh, 10. Um, what I'm going to present to you is largely the work of my colleagues. Uh, I have the real privilege of every day uh, walking into work and being a little bit intimidated because I work with such a smart group of people. So I don't want to take credit for um, all this work. Much of this is theirs. So this presentation is split up into four categories. Um, the theory, so I'll throw that out first. Then I'll give you some background about how the economy of the West has changed. So this is sort of the frame. Um, and then we'll talk about who's going to succeed in this changing economy and where will that happen. So um, we've evolved as small group primates. And so how are we going to succeed in a, in a global economy? And here's the theory. I, I think people who are well connected to other people, people who communicate well, are going to do very well. And communities that are well connected to large cities are going to do very well. And, and this, in a way, is the punchline. Uh, this is what's happened to Bozeman's airport. We're now global players, largely because of this. Um, it used to be, when we first moved here, um, we thought, wow, we're in the middle of nowhere. We're 10 hours drive from the nearest city. Uh, what type of place is this to raise a kid? Uh, 25 years later, we're right in the middle of a global economy. And maybe this is a theory of how we've evolved um, in a place like Bozeman. What brought us here, uh, what brought the early pioneers here, and what established some of the foundation of our economy was resource extraction and agriculture. And then tourists discovered the place, because it's also beautiful. And then the ski areas expanded. And the ski areas expanded, and they needed more and more people. So Big Sky Ski Corporation says to Northwest Airlines, we'll guarantee any empty seats. So if a plane shows up with empty seats, we'll buy those seats. So suddenly, because the tourism grow, grows to industrial proportions, and we need large volumes of people to fill up the ski areas, we develop our transportation infrastructure. It used to be that when you flew in and out of here, you flew on these little, what we used to call vomit comets. They were these tiny little <laughs> planes. And, and now um, our airport looks like a, a commuter train station with people going in and out from all over the world. Then once you do that, once you develop that transportation infrastructure, you've really opened up the doors. And in come the high-tech, footloose businesses, the folks who can locate pretty much anywhere. 
uh, investment income starts to move in, retirees move in with their money. Uh, you get home building starts to increase, the healthcare industry increases, and you get this phenomena called amenity migration, which is the notion that people care where they live, and they start moving to beautiful places like Bozeman because of its quality of life. And then when they do that, they start establishing businesses, and from that, the economy then diversifies and grows. So a theme throughout my presentation is really airports, but if we, if we think back in, let's say, the, about the 1700s, the clusters of economic development, the cities that grew, uh, grew where we had water, shipping ports. So along the Mississippi, along uh, all the ports, along both coasts, um, and along the canals. Then in the 1800s, um, the railroads came and cities started spreading across the landscape according to the distribution of the railroads. And then we had uh, World War II, one of the developments out of World War II was the interstate highway system, initially as a way to move equipment across, military equipment across the country, but it quickly filled with um, trucks, uh, moving material across uh, the country, and moving people. And then also, um, largely because of World War II, we developed the technology uh, on airports and airplanes, and people started flying across the world pretty quickly after the war. And that technology keeps developing. So that's sort of theory. Um, let's take a break here and let's look at this in context. Let's think about how the West has changed. Um, since 1970, a couple of remarkable things have happened. 90% of the growth in personal income, so this is real personal income adjusted for inflation, 90% of that growth has been in service industries and in non-labor income. And I'll tell you here what that means. So service industries um, is doctors, engineers, lawyers, accountants, but also waiters and barbers. It's a real mixture of high wage and low wage industries. And then non-labor income is retirement, investments, social security, Medicaid, Medicare, those sorts of things. Um, I had somebody ask me once how they could get a non-labor income job. <laughs> Um, and then you have government, uh, local, state, and federal, and then the non-services, which is really a mixture of construction, manufacturing, mining, oil and gas, and agriculture. Um, in Montana and in Gallatin County, the figures look very similar. Gallatin County is a little different. You'll see the non-service category is growing as well largely driven by construction, and then we also have government growing largely because of the university. But this pattern is very similar um, throughout the West, especially places that have airports. So here's a pie chart, and I blew it up um, to highlight the two largest pieces. 36% of personal income is from non-labor, 46.6%, almost, almost half, is from service industries. And it's very similar in the non-metro West. So if you peel away the cities and just look at the rural part of the West, we see a very similar pattern. A little bit more dependence on non-labor income, more retirement income, for example, and a little bit higher dependence on extractive industries and mining and oil and gas and timber at around 5.3%. So in terms of jobs in the West, this is what this looks like roughly in the last decade. Um, you see here on the right places where we've had net job growth and on the left places where we've, sectors where we've lost jobs. We've added 1.4 million new jobs in about the last 13 years. 93% of those are in services. And if you look at the top categories, health is the leading category. That's closely tied to some demographic trends that I'll talk about, followed by real estate, followed by professional, technical, and, ser and, and service industries. So that's architects and lawyers and engineers. So the largest components of income growth have been from sectors that are called services, that are the relatively high wage component of the service industry. And as we'll see, this isn't happening everywhere, and this isn't benefiting necessarily everybody. So why the growth in services? Well, there's, you can look at it from a demand point of view. Um, there's more aging people, a demand for healthcare. 
Um, there's uh, a demand for people who know how to use software, computer-aided design and graphic uh, artists and that sort of thing. Leisure is part of this as well. As people's incomes rise, they spend more time outdoors and they spend more time buying services related to recreation. And then you have some supply-related um, causes of this. Some of it is industries that didn't used to exist, um, software being one of them. Um, and then some of it, about 30% of the increase in service industries growth, is related really to outsourcing, and I mean not outsourcing to other countries, but a function that used to be part of the firm, let's say uh, accounting, for example, a factory that had accountants, is now hiring out its accounting work to another firm, and it now gets counted as services rather than as manufacturing. That accounts for about 36% of that growth. So um, I've got a series of cartoons that a local artist here, Robert Rath, drew for me to help illustrate what this means, how the assembly line has changed. So we've gone from an assembly line that's in one place to a scattered global assembly line. So, so think, think back in the 1950s, we had uh, a blue collar worker on the factory floor and we had on the second floor the accountants and the engineers. Um, and then raw materials went in one end and uh, a finished product came out the other end. And the most important point behind this is that it was all in one place, right? So cars and, 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 and and steel in Pittsburgh. Um, fast forward to today and think of an entrepreneur. She moves to Bozeman because she likes to go fly fishing and she has an idea. And she's a very well-connected individual. She communicates well. She likes to travel. And she starts putting her network into action. And she finds some financing. Let's say somebody in, in New York. She writes a business plan and then she starts to get into action and she hires some subcontracting work to uh, some software designers, let's say in Seattle. And then she uh, hires some engineers, uh, maybe somebody in Germany or in the Netherlands. The point is she's connected to a global economy and she's doing this out of Bozeman. And the assembly line now is a scattered global assembly line. And what we're seeing in some places, what gets counted by economists as services, is really still part of goods production. So engineering and architecture, for example, are very much part of goods production. You can't be an architect without something being built, right? But you could do that activity from anywhere. And more importantly, she flies around. She's connected via the airport. And then somewhere in the world, it rolls off the assembly line where they do the routine assembly, the routine tasks. It's either in a place where wages are lower or more and more it's being done by a robot. So how does this manifest itself in the numbers? So this graph shows you all industries in the U.S. In orange are jobs and in blue is the value of production. So it's the contribution to gross domestic product from all industries. And you can see that the relationship between jobs and value has been pretty steady. Lately, however, a bit of a decoupling. We can see that the value of production is outpacing the number of jobs created. What's causing much of that is what's happened in manufacturing. So if we look at one of the largest components of the service industries, which is professional, scientific, and technical services, so these are scientists, uh, researchers, engineers, lawyers, architects, accountants. Um, these are all occupations that require a fairly high degree of um, training and expertise. So the relationship there between uh, value of production and jobs is quite high. The value of production and jobs, that relationship is quite high with healthcare as well. And then when we look at manufacturing, we can see one of the things that's happened to this country. The, uh, in, in, in the last 35 years, we've lost about 7.8 million manufacturing jobs. In all that time, the value of production has gone up by more than $300 billion. So there's been a decoupling in manufacturing between the value of production and labor. 
Um, about 1970, about a, a quarter of U.S. workers were in manufacturing. Today, it's about one in 10. And uh, a lot of these jobs have been lost, not so much to outsourcing to other countries, but to the effects of automation. So a, about a quarter of the decline in manufacturing can be attributed to imports from China. Um, but even in China, we're seeing that the relationship between jobs and, and, and manufacturing uh, and, and uh, the value of production is changing. For example, in China, um, manufacturing contributed 40% of GDP in 1980, and it's only about 30% today. Uh, Germany, which has always been known as a manufacturing powerhouse, um, the manufacturing contributed about 30% of GDP back in 1980, and today it's about 20%. So services uh, account worldwide to about 70% of value-added um, production. So what that looks like, on this figure you can see in orange is manufacturing, and in blue are the service industries, two example service industries. And um, the people who work in service industries, um, professional, scientific, and technical services and health services, they have um, a lower unemployment rate, higher average earnings per job than manufacturing, and there's quite a few more of them than there are in manufacturing. So that's kind of what's happened in the sectors, how the sectors of the economy have changed. Now let's talk about this mysterious thing called non-labor income. Um, some of it is because of the stock market <laughs> and private savings. Some of it is due to an aging population. Um, and, and some of it is due to the baby boomers. In fact, I would argue quite a bit of it is. Uh, who are the baby boomers? Um, well, we were born between uh, 1946 and 1964. Um, there's about 75 million of us. Uh, by 2020, 25% uh, of the workers are going to be 55 years or older. That's, that's in five years, one in four of us are going to be 55 years and older. Um, every month, a quarter of a million Americans turn 65. It's our retirement age. Uh, and baby boomers control about 80% of the financial assets of this country. Yet today, 17% of baby boomers have retired. So think of this as an age-wage tsunami <laughs> that is headed our way. Where will these people live? What will they buy? How much money will they have left in savings by the time they retire? We don't know. Uh, this is going to be one of the big trends in the U.S. economy. So non-labor income, it's really made up of three parts. Dividends, interest, and rent, or money earned from past investments, that's about 20% of the total personal income in the West. And then you have age-related income, Social Security, Medicare, Medicare, that sort of thing, that's about 8% of total personal income. Followed by what we call hardship payments, so this is Medicaid. Uh, welfare and unemployment, that's about 5.5% of total personal income. And then there's another category called other that includes things like uh, student loans. Um, it's 36% of total personal income, and it's 60% of the net income growth in the last decade. So who's going to succeed, and where is this success going to happen? Um, probably the most obvious figure that you see is, well, it has to do with education. The higher your education level, so the higher up on this figure, the lower your unemployment rate, and uh, the higher your average earnings. Um, but it's not exactly that simple. So let me introduce you to a little bit of literature here. This is an interesting book if you ever get a chance. Country Bookshelf has it. It's called The New Geography of Jobs. It's by Enrico Moretti from uh, Berkeley. And he says that in the 20th century, competition was about accumulating physical capital. And today, it's about attracting the best uh, human capital. Um, he points out that there are parts in this country that, where the unemployment rate is quite high. And he also points out that there are parts of this country where there's a real shortage of educated workers. 
Um, and this is especially true in the high wage, high tech sectors. Um, and he points out that for every job in the high tech sectors, on average about five additional jobs are created in the rest of the economy. Uh, in contrast, in manufacturing, the ratio there is about 1 to 1.6. So why, why is high tech so, um, why does it have such a high multiplier effect? Well, some of the ideas are that um, it's very well paid. Uh, they tend to cluster together. There's a bit of a snowballing effect, which makes them quite profitable. And high tech is also very labor intensive. It's really hard to automate um, innovation. Um, Fortune magazine uh, the other day had this intriguing article, Humans Are Underrated. It's worth looking at because they summarize some of the, um, some of the literature by economists on this topic. Um, just to give you a sense, you know, a lot of things can be automated. Uh, here's an example. The, the, the single largest occupation for American men in this country is truck driving. We have 2.9 million truck drivers in this country. Um, and just a few weeks ago, Daimler in the deserts of Nevada has been testing semi-trucks that are driverless. Um, and it sounds a little weird, but you know, we have friends who are pilots and they get into a plane and they push a button that says Frankfurt. And the plane takes off and it lands in Frankfurt. <laughs> Where's click? But did I, I got that more or less right, I think. Um, so to find out you know, whether we're going to be automated, we really need to think, what are we especially good at? We're, we're good at solving problems as a group. Um, we're good at satisfying each other's interpersonal needs. We know how to make each other happy. We're good storytellers. Uh, we like to tell stories, and we like to have stories told to us. And, and we trust fellow human beings as leaders in a way that we, we would never trust a machine. So some of the things that we're good at are empathy, looking into each other's eyes and establishing trust. So there's a couple of economists um, at Oxford, Carl Frey and Michael Osborne. And I know there's a lot going on in this figure here, so I'll explain it to you. This is the distribution of all the jobs in the US. And what they did is they categorized all the jobs according to the standard occupational categories, SOX categories as they're called. And these are categories that describe what somebody does for a living. What you actually do in your job, right? What does it consist of? Most remarkable thing is they claim that about 47% of employment has a high probability of being, as they say, computerized. And what they mean by that is where you lose your job to automation, about 47%. And that's using existing technologies. So um, this is a bit what those occupations look like. So people in management and finance, computer engineering and science, and education and healthcare will fare better than people who do routine service industries. But, but here's really the takeaway. It's the routine, the repetitive, and the predictable that's going to be automated. And what won't be automated are occupations that are strong, that require strong interpersonal skills, complex perception and improvisation. Um, so there's a different study uh, by the consulting company uh, McKinsey. And they took a different approach. They said, instead of looking at occupations, let, let's look at activities, activities that people do. And so they, they, they came up with a fairly um, different measure. They said about 45% of people's activities could be automated. They say there's only about um, 5% of occupations that with current technology would be entirely automated. It's more each one of us in our daily work can probably find a few things that a machine could do better. So even a CEO, they estimate that about 20% of their job could be automated with existing technologies. So rather than occupations, now we're looking at activities. Um, there's a relationship, according to Frey and Osborne, between wages and education. And basically what they're po pointing out here 
is that you have a higher probability of being computerized um, if you earn low wages and have low education. Now the guys at uh, um, McKinsey um, say not so fast. Um, they said this could happen at any education level and at any wage level, that there are activities within all of our work days that are probably going to be automated. Um, this is either a source of despair or the folks at McKinsey take a more um, optimistic view and they say, isn't that wonderful? It means we're getting rid of the drudgery and it frees up human labor to do some things that are more creative. Um, let me shift now and now we're going to talk about where. So we're talking about the West and we think about the West as the land of wide open spaces, of an area that's largely rural. Well, the West is actually the most urban area of the country. We have 89% of the people in the, left, in the West live in metro areas, compared to 75% elsewhere. The only region in the country that's as metro as we are is the Northeast. So Washington, D.C., Boston, New York City. Um, so that, I find that striking. We also find out that the concentration of jobs is mostly in a handful of places. So in the West, 75% of all jobs are where these circles are. And by the way, I forgot to say this earlier, all of this stuff that I'm showing you, these sorts of figures, on our website, if you click on the data visualization tab, there's dozens of tools. Pour yourself a beer, open up your laptop, and have, a, have at it. You can scroll across all the states in the country and you can see, you can, this bubbles will move and enlarge and shrink and things wiggle on the screen more than they do here in a PowerPoint. Um, so 75% of the jobs are located in about 10% uh, of the counties. So you can see it's the front range of Colorado, it's the Wasatch Front of Washington, it's Boise, it's uh, Puget Sound, it's Portland, it's uh, Southern California, San Francisco, the Bay Area, Las Vegas, uh, Tucson, Phoenix, and, uh, and Albuquerque. Um, in Montana, 75% of all the jobs are in these six counties. Incidentally, these are also the counties that have airports. So. Um, Another interesting book worth getting at the library is by Edward Glazer from Harvard. He's an economist who spends a lot of time um, pontificating about uh, urban areas. And, and he puts it, I think, fairly nicely. Um, for over a century, the pundits have predicted that new forms of communication would make urban life irrelevant. And he was talking about the telephone and the fax machine and the computer and the internet and telecommunications. And he says, to defeat human need for face-to-face -face contact, our technological marvels would need to defeat millions of years of human evolution that have made us into machines for learning from the people next to us. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Gordon Oriens, who's an ecologist at the University of Washington, put it more succinctly. He said, we've evolved as small group primates. So I'm going to leave you with another theory, and this is a theory that we tested, and the theory was that the West had actually three types of counties, that there's really three Wests that you can categorize according to access to markets. And if you know about these three Wests, then you have a pretty good sense of what the economic development opportunities are for different counties. So in the red, we have counties that have at their core a city of 50,000 or more, many of these are millions or more, and surrounding them are the counties that, uh, where it's easy for people to commute in. So it's the metro commuter shed, if you will. So that's in red. In blue are all these counties that are in a rural setting, very much the Bozemans of the world. You know, if you drive through, you go, ah, this is kind of a very rural place. Um, but we have an airport with daily commercial service to major hubs. So we're connected to the rest of the world. And then in gray are the, are the rural and isolated. It's hard for you if you're in one of those gray counties to drive to a city or to even drive to uh, a town that has an airport so you can fly out. So again, this is a wonderful tool on our website where things move on the screen where you click on different counties and it, it, there's no music, but it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, 
this is, um, when, when we think about the consequences of this, uh, and by the way, we've also published this in, uh, in the Journal of Rural Studies, if you want to uh, look at the statistics behind this. But, so every dot over there, the red, blue, and gray dots, are, represent a county. And so these are economic indicators. So on average, uh, we know that the, the, uh, the, the cities have lower income volatility. They have a more stable economy. And the rural areas have a more volatile economy. And it, it, it makes sense. Rural areas are much more dependent on commodity markets, so they are, as commodity prices fluctuate, so does their economy. Um, we also know that the average earnings per job are higher in a city, they're higher in the places that are connected, and they're the lowest in, uh, in the rural areas. And then we know that dependence on jobs and high wage services, which tend to get, congregate in cities, they also tend to exist in um, in the places that have airports, and you don't see those very much in isolated areas. There's a few outliers that you might be wondering about. A few counties that are isolated, that have, have high concentrations of jobs and high wage services. Those are remote counties that host government research facilities. Sandia Labs and INEL. So nothing like a bunch of PhD nuclear physicists to kind of Let's throw the statistics off kilter a little bit here. Um, in terms of demographic uh, indicators, the, the, the cities have um, uh, faster population growth. They, have, um, they tend to be getting younger. Um, the counties in the middle, the blue also, the rural areas tend to be getting older. And then uh, in terms of college attainment, of course, there's some significant differences there too. Um, so let me go back to the map I showed at the beginning, but this time in red, this is the map I have in my office. And in red is the one hour, one hour drive time to the nearest airport. So when I'm on the phone with somebody, for example, somebody who wants to create a new national park in northern Maine, and would that be a good idea? I scurry to the map and I want to know is there an airport nearby? Because if there is, it's a different conversation than if there isn't. So this is almost your economic development opportunity map for the West. Um, we know that the economy has changed a lot in the last few decades. And we know that the, uh, a lot of the jobs are concentrated around um, cities. Or, or in smaller cities that are connected via airports. Um, the bad news is that people lost their jobs during the recession, quite a few people. And the people who lost their jobs during the recession, for those who went back to work, on average, their wages were 11% lower than before the recession. So there's a, a tremendous amount of um, uh, nervousness, and you could hear it in the presidential debates. Um, who's to blame for this? And if you look at the economic literature, it's kind of all over the place, and economists don't necessarily agree with each other. So here's a smattering of some of the explanations. Um, automization, robots, technology is partly to blame. Trade liberalization, deregulation, uh, the loss of trade unions, um, minimum wage not keeping up with the cost of living. There's bits, and bits of truth in all of those uh, explanations. Um, but regardless of the cause, we're in, a, we're in a transition. We made a transition from an agrarian economy, an agrarian economy to one based on manufacturing. Now we're making a transition from an economy based on natural resources to one based more and more on human resources. And when you make that transition, there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. Um, are we going to lose our jobs to automation? Uh, we might in some occupations. Or as the McKinsey report says, Automation might free up some of our time to do what humans are good at, like being creative and creating social bonds. Um, and maybe that's where the good, lose, good news lies. And that's, we've evolved in tight social circles. Uh, small group primates, as my ecologist friend likes to say. And we need the opportunity to see each other in person. We need to see each other face to face. We need to look each other in the eye. We need to establish trust. So I'll leave you that piece of good news. And that is the people who will succeed are probably going to be those 
who focus the most on being good human beings. So thanks for your time, and I'd love to hear some feedback.